Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome both to those of you here in the library at Campion Hall in Oxford and those of you joining us online. My name is Father Nick Austin, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Trinity Term 2023's Campion Lecture, T.S. Eliot, Terrible Celibate, Suffering and Sexuality in the Letters to Emily Hale. This term's Campion Lecture is delivered by uh, Professor Jamie Steyer, who is a Jesuit priest and professor of English at the University of uh, Loyola, Chicago. And it's been a real privilege having Jamie here as a visiting fellow in religion and literature uh, this year. Uh, no sooner had he arrived than he was in the Bodleian Library and was coming back reporting, finding things written by Eliot that we weren't quite aware of before. And it's that archival research, both in the Bodleian and in Eliot's London flat, which has um, helped to contribute um, to his work whilst here. Jamie specialises in 20th century literature and music, and especially in the poetry and prose of T.S. Eliot. His book, Becoming T.S. Eliot, focuses on the development of audience and voice in the early poetry of Eliot. And uh, Jamie, delighted that you're offering this uh, Campion Lecture. It's very good to have you with us, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks for your kind introduction and for... Oh. Thanks for that introduction and for the invitation to speak. Uh, and thanks to all the folks here at Campion Hall who work so hard uh, to run such an event and a formal dinner. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here addressing my, the Campion Hall mates here in our beautiful library. And I'm especially honored to have a number of uh, friends and colleagues from the Elliott world who, who have come tonight. And I want to introduce three of those now since they play a part in my talk and Nick will introduce the other guests uh, later at dinner. So one of the primary sources for my talk tonight is the newly published letters to Emily Hale. And the editor of those letters and of many other volumes of Eliot's letters is Dr. John Haffenden, the professor emeritus at University of Sheffield. So wave John so that we can see the famous people among us. Uh, these letters are available to read online at tselliot.com, the website of the T.S. Eliot Foundation, under the Letters tab. Eliot's widow, Valerie, died in 2012, and her multiple projects of funding artists, charitable causes, and publishing her husband's work have been faithfully carried out by her close friend and the current trustee of the T.S. Eliot Foundation, Claire Rehill. I will not make her wave. She doesn't like being <laughs> called out like that. But I just want to honor her. Uh, she was the one who decided to offer these long-anticipated letters to the world for free. And thirdly, the biographer who has done the most to prepare the ground for these, le for these letters is Dr. Lyndall Gordon. She is Professor Emerita at St. Hilda's College, Oxford. Wave, wave, Lyndall. There's, there's another famous person among us. Her recently published biography, The Hyacinth Girl, is devoted entirely to the Elliot Hale relationship. So if you want the whole story, part of which I'll be telling tonight, uh, then her book is the best place to start. My current book project is with the Religion Around series at Penn State University Press. It will illuminate the religious contexts surrounding Eliot's life and work. And those religious contexts are numerous and varied. Eliot was born into the Unitarian world of Boston. Many of his family members were involved in church ministry, and his grandfather, William Greenleaf Eliot, was a beloved and formidable Unitarian minister in St. Louis, Missouri. He was a mover and shaker in that town's early history. As their name indicates, Unitarians distinguish themselves from Trinitarians. But as the old joke goes, there is at least one trinity to which Unitarians subscribe. The fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the neighborhood of Boston. <laughs> Eliot's family was rooted in Boston, 
though it was based in St. Louis, where Elliot was born and raised. The family summered in Boston every year, and Elliot went to university in nearby Cambridge. The atmosphere of Elliot's youth was marked by the Protestant tone unique to New England. Calvinist moralizing, a Puritan distrust of sexuality, and a work ethic that understood material wealth as a sign of God's blessing, and poverty and suffering as a sign of his disfavor. But by the time he was in graduate school, Eliot had rejected his inherited religion, and in pointed contrast to it, he studied Eastern religions, studying original texts in Sanskrit. He became a member of Harvard's Buddhist Society. Uh, and when he came here to Merton College in 1914, he was decidedly unimpressed with Oxford's Buddhist Society. In these years of wandering, he was less a committed Buddhist than a disheartened philosophy student, searching for the absolute in the outer reaches of reason and intellect. The last large shift in Eliot's religious life was his conversion to the Church of England at the age of 38. Shortly after his conversion, and partly because he lived next door to St. Cyprian's in Marylebone, he became affiliated with his church's Anglo-Catholic wing. Once he committed to the Christian faith, the life oriented to God alone became an intellectual and artistic preoccupation for the rest of his life. For tonight's talk, I've chosen two themes from Eliot's work, suffering and sexuality, both of them shaped by his Unitarian and later Christian contexts. And the source I've chosen for the first part of this talk is the recently published letters to Emily Hale, because they reveal aspects of his life that we hadn't known before. For the non Eliot specialists in the audience, which is most of you, here's a quick sketch for context, a sketch of the contemporary terrain of Eliot studies. Thanks to the T.S. Eliot editorial project, we have seen an explosion of materials that were previously unknown or difficult to access. Just in the past 14 years, we've had 10 new volumes of letters, eight volumes of complete prose, and two deliciously fat volumes of poetry, with more prose, letters, and plays to come soon. Bliss is it in this dawn to be alive. <laughs> The archive of letters to Emily Hale has only recently been accessible to scholars. Although it was Emily Hale herself who had deposited the letters at Princeton University, it was Eliot who had insisted that they be sequestered for 50 years after the deaths of both of them. That archive of over a thousand letters was finally opened to researchers in January of 2020. Scholars who had been waiting decades to see them had a tantalizing two months to absorb their contents until the pandemic shut down the library and all of our lives. They are love letters, though Emily Hale was never Eliot's lover or mistress in the traditional sense. She was, however, much more than a friend. As Eliot saw her, or as we like to say in academia, as Eliot constructed her, she was his muse, his Beatrice, his chaste beloved, the woman toward whom he directed all of his romantic energy for years. They had known each other as children, but it was in graduate school in 1914 that Eliot first declared his love for Hale. At that time, Hale apparently gave him no reason to believe that she returned his affections, and so, disappointed, Eliot went off to Merton College, Oxford, and in 1915, in Schofield Thayer's rooms at Maudlin College, Eliot met the vivacious, unstable Vivian Haywood. He impulsively married her a few weeks later, and they lived miserably ever after. As he explained his decision later in life, he wanted to burn his boats and remain in England as a poet rather than return to America as an academic philosopher. Within weeks of the wedding day, Eliot and Vivian had established the patterns of illness, codependency, addictions, and infidelities that would mar their lives together. 
short digression into the archives. I don't remember why I read this. Maybe this front crew of Elliot people can remember where I read it. But sometime recently, someone has claimed that Elliot's friend Schofield Thayer occupied the same rooms at Magdalen College where Oscar Wilde met Alfred Douglas. I followed up on this idea with Dr. Emily Jennings, archivist at Magdalen, who helped me to sort this out. It turns out that in 1915, Thayer lived in a three-room set at Cloisters No. 8, while 25 years earlier, Douglas had lived in another part of the college entirely. So Wilde could not have met with Douglas in the same room where Thayer lived. Tantalizingly, though, during the 1870s, during Oscar Wilde's time as a student at Maudlin, the playwright did occupy what looks to be the same room, Cloisters No. 8, probably the source of that claim. However, because of subsequent remodeling, rearrangement, and renumbering, it's not at all likely that Wilde's and Thayer's student rooms were ever the same. It's a story that should be true even if it isn't. The place where Eliot met Vivian and where Wilde met Bosey. Just imagine the sign that could be hung outside such an imaginary room. Warning. <laughs> if you find yourself attracted to anyone you meet in these rooms, run the other way. While the Eliot's marriage had moments of affection and years of dutiful care, in the end, Vivian's emotional onslaughts, her chemical addictions, and her deteriorating physical and mental health became too much for Eliot to bear after 17 years. He separated from her in 1933, an arrangement that Vivian fought desperately. After increasingly delusional episodes, she was certified by medical authorities and ended her life in an asylum. Even after he separated from Vivian and after she was certified, Elliot did not divorce her. In the 1930s, civil divorce was practically impossible for someone like Elliot, and morally, Elliot firmly believed that neither divorce nor annulment was an option for an Anglican. In the midst of this failing marriage, Elliot never lost contact with his friend from Boston, Emily Hale. The correspondence between them in the first decade of, of his marriage was most likely patchy, and it does not seem to have been especially intimate. But sometime in 1923, Eliot met Hale in Eccleston Square in London. It's not clear exactly what was said during this meeting, but it seems that Eliot told Hale that he still loved her. What followed this event was decades of passionate and difficult love letters, even though Elliot and Hale were separated by an ocean for most of their relationship. The earliest letters from the Princeton archive date to 1930. In these first letters, Elliot begs permission to pour out his heart to Hale, even though he could not offer her anything more than friendship. For a few years, Hale responded cagely but generously, baffled by his ardor for her, but allowing his adoration to continue. As you would expect of a long correspondence, some of the letters are banal news sharing and minor gossip. But one of the great surprises of the archive is witnessing such a normally reserved man writing at the pitch of love and torment. Now you have made me perfectly happy. That is, happier than I have ever been in my life. The only kind of happiness now possible for the rest of my life is now with me. And though it is the deepest happiness, which is identical with my deepest love and sorrow, it is a kind of supernatural ecstasy. In his recent biography of Eliot, Robert Crawford asks the question of Eliot's needs. Did he want a mother, a muse, a lover, another wife, or the Blessed Virgin? Since my mother died, I have felt very much alone, and you will take some of her place for me too. I loved her very much and felt much sympathy with her, 
and like to think that you and she are somewhat alike. Much later in life, when Elliot was married to his second wife, Valerie, Elliot burned all of Hale's letter to him in a fit of pique. But even though we do not have Hale's side of the correspondence, we, we, there are a few letters have survived, but most of them were burned. Some of her attitudes and her personality can be glimpsed through the responses that Elliot makes to her no longer extant correspondence. She, understandably, felt that the relationship was abnormal. Elliot responds, of course the situation is abnormal, but would be much more so if I pretended to you or myself that it is normal or that I do not long to be with you always. There are times when my arms literally ache with the emptiness. What struck me in my first read through these letters was how emotionally needy Eliot is, how raw is his anguish. After years of being adored and praised, Hale found herself finally falling in love with Eliot. He was ecstatic. How shall I speak to my love, or of her, or how to celebrate her? I cannot tonight write a letter. I can only think of last evening and this morning and having learnt recently release from my pent-up tenderness by holding her in my arms on my lap and pressing my face to hers to intoxicate myself with the air she breathed out, how can I discipline myself again to the use of mere words? In this new phase of their love, one of Eliot's recurring nicknames for Hale becomes Ripe Raspberry Mouth. <laughs> My dear, pure dove, my darling, ripe raspberry mouth, it is as the latter that I habitually mention you and your mother and father in my prayers. If such moments are jarring, this juxtaposition of silly endearment with solemn prayer, then that discord is the price we pay to enter into this idiosyncratic relationship. To read these letters with sympathy is to allow that lovers' endearments will always sound ridiculous to outsiders. To offer another example, I'm thinking of the, the animal nicknames that Christopher Isherwood and Don Bacardi gave to each other, Dobbin and Kitty. As outsiders, we might chuckle at such language, but only a cynic would scoff at it. There are any number of things that we can be critical about in these letters. A distasteful antisemitism, while not a surprise, makes unwelcome appearances in these letters. But I want to focus on a different problem, namely Eliot's apparently sincere belief that he was living a celibate life. Since October, I have been suddenly and completely freed from the sexual strain of celibacy under the conditions under which I live. How do we square Eliot's passionate expressions of love with his belief that he was practicing celibacy. The majority of these letters were written when he was married to someone else. And further, what do we make of their physical expressions of love on those occasions that they could be together? I think of your birthday night at the moment when I first kissed you on the neck and you curved your head over me as if you wanted me to kiss you there. And it seemed to me for that moment as if my kiss meant more to you than any of my few kisses had ever meant to you before. And then I think of the later evenings when I knew you liked me to kiss you, and of that delicious moment when I held you in my lap and we both fell asleep for a moment, and I waked myself up so as not to lose the enjoyment of our sleeping. When this archive was first opened three years ago, there was a lot of angry public comment. Twitter warriors decided at a glance that Elliot had been a cad, even though what we knew in early 2020 was based on very quick readings and patchy summaries of this large archive. What made so many commentators enraged was the turn the relationship took in 1947 when things got complicated. 
Eliot's first wife, Vivian, died unexpectedly in January of 1947 in the asylum where she had been committed. After decades of telling Hale that he would marry her if only it were possible, Eliot surprises and devastates her by announcing that he cannot go through with it. As he tried to explain, he was not in love with anyone else and sincerely believed that it was his horror of sex and the guilty memory of Vivian that made marriage forever impossible for him. What we know in retrospect, of course, is that within a few years, he hired a secretary, Valerie Flatcher, fell in love with her and married her. They lived happily ever after. But Eliot's rejection of Hale in 1947 has been understood by critics as the originating problem. Had he married her, he would be the faithful hero, but instead he abandoned a woman to whom he had promised eternal love. In an earlier talk I gave on the Hale letters, I argued that we need to back up in time and identify a much earlier problem than the great no of 1947. Unlike most other commentators on these letters, I think that the tragedy of the Elliot-Hale relationship had little to do with Elliot's opposition to divorce or even his change of mind in 1947, and more to do with the fact that Elliot was a terrible celibate. To offer a more precise argument, it was Eliot's fumbling, over-spiritualized practice of celibacy that is at the root of the ethical problems in their relationship. Here, for example, is a common idea that I am trying to combat. In Crawford's recent biography, he argues, Tom's celibacy remained inviolate, though his desire for female companionship stayed strong. In my reading of the letters, Eliot's celibacy is anything but inviolate. What the letters make increasingly clear is that Eliot seemed to assume that because he was not having sexual intercourse with Hale, that there were no moral stakes in his courtship of her affections. In these letters, Eliot occasionally registers qualms that his monopolizing of Hale's affections is unfair to her. At one point, he confesses to be haunted by the fear that I have interfered in your life far more than I was aware of or had any right to do. But even when he does make this kind of acknowledgement, it does not modify his behavior. For me, as a spiritual director and as a confessor, uh, the biggest alarm bell in the letters, and one that I don't think any other critic has commented on yet, is that Eliot declines to discuss openly with his spiritual advisor the problems he is struggling with. A telling moment comes with, in his letters to Hale when he describes to Hale his recent conversation with his confessor, Father Francis Underhill, uh, the, the brother, by the way, of Evelyn Underhill. I did not talk to Underhill about us on this occasion, it did not, of course, enter into my confession as there was nothing to confess, except whether it was wrong to allow one's mind to be so engrossed by the thought of a person from whom one was separated. About which he reassured me. In implying to his confessor that Hale is merely a faraway abstraction instead of a woman with whom he was intimately involved, it seems that Eliot has strategically left out a lot in his confession. It is a principle of spiritual direction and of therapy that the very thing that you are hiding from your director or confessor is exactly the thing that you're supposed to be talking about. In the work that I've been doing this year at the Eliot Foundation in London, I recently came across this book in Eliot's library. But there's no annotations in it. I suspect he never read it. It might seem that I am leading to the resounding and self-righteous conclusion that Eliot had no business declaring his love to a woman to whom he, whom he was not free to marry. But I think that judgment is too censorious, and I want to read the letters with as much sympathy as I can. On the one hand, Eliot clearly needed the affection of women all his life, 
and many women eagerly filled that need in turn. His mother, Vivian, Polly Tandy, Emily Hale, Mary Hutchinson, Virginia Woolf, Mary Trevelyan, and finally, his devoted second wife, Valerie. Eliot's letters to all of these women have a quality of intimacy that he does not risk even with his closest male friends. So he needed and deserved such intimacy in his life. But on the other hand, if Eliot had been able to place Hale's needs above his own, then he might have freed her to find the kind of love that she needed. And that, by the way, is the point of celibacy that Eliot never understood. In the Christian tradition, the practice of celibacy and the purpose of celibacy is not the absence of sex, but the presence of non-possessive love that allows the other to flourish. Such a love on Eliot's part might not only have freed Hale, but freed himself to find a companion like Mary Trevelyan. She was a hearty sort, to use Linda Gordon's excellent description of this woman. Trevelyan could offer Eliot intimacy, but she was more independent and less emotionally fragile than Hale. Given Eliot's greater fame and personal agency, perhaps the last word on the letters should be given to Hale. She understood only partially the role of chaste muse that Eliot imposed on her, and though she chafed against it and asserted her own self-understanding, ultimately she could have walked away from the relationship, but chose not to. In stark contrast to Eliot's cruel and dismissive description of Hale at the end of his life, Hale's retrospective account of their relationship is magnanimous. The memory of the years when we were most together and so happy are mine always, and I am grateful that this period brought some of his best writing and an assured, charming personality, which perhaps I helped to stabilize. Before moving away from the Hale letters, I want to point out another item of interest regarding Eliot's sexuality, namely his attitude to queerness. I've long been interested in queer readings of Eliot, although I've always resisted the facile outings of Eliot as a repressed homosexual that were popular in the 1980s. Yves Kozofsky Sedgwick's theorizations of the epistemology of the closet, powerful as they were, lent themselves to binary readings of sexuality, through no fault of Kozofsky Sedgwick herself. As a consequence, all males were understood to be repressed gay men if they did not express a narrowly masculinist affect. In Eliot's studies, there were only a few critics who argued that the poet was a repressed gay man, and serious scholars paid no attention to them. However, accusations of Eliot's homophobia have been taken seriously, partly because of an ugly episode in the 1950s. The literary critic John Peter argued in a journal article that Eliot's The Wasteland was an elegy for a deceased male lover. The benighted assistant professor actually sent a copy of the letter of the article to Eliot, imagining that the poet would be pleased. Eliot was rather incensed by it, <laughs> and he sent his solicitors to threaten libel action and demanded that copies of the journal be retrieved and destroyed. This episode in Eliot's life only represents his fear for his public reputation. Living in a country that had not yet repealed the Labouchere Amendment, and where authors' reputations and lives could be ruined by such a smear, Eliot had reason to be concerned, though his response to the poor assistant professor was surely overkill. The letters to Hale offer a different view of Eliot's personal attitude to queerness. At one point in the letters, he is describing the younger poet Stephen Spender, of whom he says, Spender is all that I should dislike, being a half-Jew, an invert, and a communist, but in whom I feel a curious physical attraction in spite of all that. 
if we could just bracket for a moment the obvious problem of antisemitism here. Eliot that uses a then common but not pejorative word invert to describe gay men. This comment reveals Eliot to be not at all frightened by queerness and can acknowledge within himself that his own sexuality is not so neatly binary. So that's all I have to say for now about celibacy and sexuality. Moving on to my second theme of suffering, I could stay with the Hale archive as a source. Uh, Eliot often discusses suffering in these letters. But I want to turn to a different source instead. I've been given a remarkable opportunity this year to peruse Eliot's library and to hunt for his marginalia as a part of my book project. I'm very grateful to Claire Rehill for granting me this exceptional permission to be in the private archive of the Eliot estate. My Eliot friends have been texting me jealous insults all year long. Uh, and to give one more introduction, uh, I'm grateful also to Nancy Fulford. Wave, Nancy, other famous person here. Uh, she's the archivist of the foundation, and she suffers my presence in the flat and my pestering questions. So to turn to that source now, I want to pick out a few gems from that archive, partly to prove to Claire and Nancy that my time there in the flat has been fruitful. Here is Eliot's cherished copy of Dante. He owned many different volumes and translations of the Italian author, but this tiny edition, you, you can see by the size of my fingers there, uh, this tiny edition is one that he kept in his pocket for years, memorizing lines on long train journeys. And as you can see from Eliot's own explanatory inscription on the paste down, he had bought the paperback in 1911, probably on his tour of northern Italy, then had it bound in 1922, 11 years later, to mark its importance and to protect it from further disintegration, most likely. And then late in life, his third inscription, he reinscribes it to his second wife in 1958. He often reinscribed to Valerie older books that he had owned before knowing her as a way of binding their lives and their libraries together, and to bring his much younger wife into the substance of his intellectual concerns. As you would expect of a favored author like Dante, this book and his other multiple copies of Dante are filled with interesting uh, marginal annotations. Dante was one of the most important influences on Eliot. Long before his conversion to Christianity, Dante's, uh, long before Eliot's conversion to Christianity, Dante's Vita Nuova and the Commedia deeply affected Eliot's poetic imagination and spiritual life. In his poetry and prose, Eliot quoted from, imitated, and alluded to countless episodes from Dante's work. But of the 14,000 lines of Dante's immense Commedia, Eliot circled back again and again to two short stanzas in the Purgatorio, marked here. And since that might not be very legible, here's a more legible transcription of those two stanzas, and I'll translate them in a minute. For the moment, let's stick with the Provencal and Italian. Just how important these two stanzas were to Eliot can be measured by the number of times that he quoted them. So here's a quick rundown of all the places that Eliot plundered these stanzas. The final two lines were Eliot's original epigraph, later deleted, to the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. The fourth line, Arabos Prec, is the title of Eliot's second book of poems. The final line, Poissa Scorsi, is quoted in his essay, Dante as Spiritual Leader. And again, that same line, Poi Suscose, appears in the Wasteland. Both stanzas are quoted in full in his prefatory essay, Dante. From line five, Som de la Scalina was used as the initial title of a poem later absorbed into Ash Wednesday. And then the second to last line from Sauven uh, the words Sauvignon Vos also appear in a different section 
of Ash Wednesday. Seven times between 1915 and 1930, Eliot used or contemplated using parts of these two stanzas. So what are these lines about? What theological key do they give us for understanding his attraction to Christianity? In these stanzas of Canto 26, Dante and Virgil have reached the seventh terrace of purgatory, where those who have misused their sexuality are expiating their sins in fire. They are curiously happy souls, weeping and singing, even as they burn in purgatorial fire. At the end of this canto, Dante meets Arnaud Daniel, a 12th century troubadour poet whose work Dante greatly admires. Arnaud addresses Dante, speaking in his native tongue of Provençal, and here is the English translation of those stanzas which so obsessed Eliot. My Provençal is non-existent, so I'm just going to read the Italian, or the English. I am Arnaud, who weeps and goes singing. I see in thought all the past folly, and I see with joy the day for which I hope before me. And so I pray you, by that virtue which leads you to the topmost of the stair, be mindful in due time of my pain. And then that close quote ends Arnaud's Provencal speech, and Dante, the narrator, concludes the canto, the final line reverting to Italian. Then dived he back into that fire which refines them. Let me call your attention to a few details in those stanzas. I've given you these stanzas not as they appear in any edition that Eliot owned, but as they appear as Eliot himself presented and translated them in his copy, in his essay on Dante. In the Italian, that last line in Italian, Eliot has presented that last line in all caps, which is not how the type is set in any edition. The all caps are his emphasis, not Dante's. Note also that the translation of the last line offers the English verb, he dived. That is an inaccurate translation of the Italian sascose, which simply means he hid. Eliot's obsession with these stanzas, the emphatic all caps of the last line, and the deliberate mistranslation of dived for hid, these details all tell us something about how Eliot thought and prayed about his suffering. Eliot suffered greatly in his own life, spiritually and psychologically, maritally and physically. And in his greatest poems written before his conversion, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, The Wasteland, The Hollow Men, there he explores the extremities of his alienation and despair. His suffering was a problem that his Unitarianism was wholly unequipped to solve for him. As he later complained of that quasi-positivist religion of his youth, it was concerned only with social custom, with what was done and what was not done, rather than what was good or evil. Likewise, the Buddhist solution to suffering found no permanent purchase with Eliot. And so, when he first came across Dante, he was gobsmacked by this idea, that in a Christian economy, one would joyfully, gleefully dive back into purgatorial fire. That suffering, in other words, had a divine purpose. Dante answers for Eliot that momentous question, what do we do with our suffering? It is not something to be grimly endured or piously ignored, but joyfully claimed as constitutive of the Christian journey to God. In Dante's original Italian, Arnaud simply returns to his purgatorial flame, hiding himself in it. But in Eliot's vivified imagination, Arnaud dives into the flame, eager to embrace his suffering 
the more quickly to effect his salvation. This Dantesque idea of suffering explains much of Eliot's subsequent religious thought, his poems Burnt Norton and Ash Wednesday, his ideas about suffering in his essay on Baudelaire. And what are Eliot's four quartets but a series of long poems in which the speaker ponders the spiritual gain to be had from renunciation? When it comes to suffering, every Catholic child has been told by a parent or a priest or a nun, offer it up. Whether the complaint is about a stubbed toe or an early bedtime or some greater tragedy, for Catholics, suffering is an occasion for grace. It is expiatory. Offering it up is what we do with our suffering, the air we breathe. Uh, there's an, another similar phrase that I've heard, which is rise above. And I've only known Southern Baptists to use this phrase, but I'm not familiar enough with Baptist religion to know if this is very common or if it's, just a, if it's a local uh, variation. But if you think about the difference between rise above and offered up, rise above is a transcendental approach to suffering. We get beyond it. We move past it. Um, there's also an element of willpower in it, rise, rise above. Whereas offer it up, uh, does not go above suffering, but through it. This idea is so common to Catholic culture that it's easily parodied. And here, of course, if I were a theologian, I would cite Augustine or Aquinas or some important theologian on uh, suffering. But I'm going to quote a comic um, because I want to show you how common this idea is and how easily parodied it is. So here's a scene that memorably parodies the Catholic attitude to suffering. It's in Hilary Mantel's comic novel, Flood. And uh, the situation is this. So Father Angwin, the pastor, has asked the men's fellowship to do some physical labor for him. And they've performed very honorably. And now he wants to reward them with tea and some food. And, but it's food that the men don't want to eat. Father Angwin. You all gentlemen should go out to the Nissen hut now. Sister Anthony has got the tea urn out and is baking you some fruit loaf. At this news, the men looked cast down. Sister Anthony, a rotund and beaming figure in her flowery apron, was feared throughout the parish. Poor old soul, Father Angwin said. She means well. Think of the good sisters. They have to face it every day. Breakfast, dinner, and tea. Do this last one thing for me, lads. And if it is very unpalatable, you must offer it up. There's not more than a handful of grit in it, Sister Philomena said, though possibly more grit than currants. You can offer it up, as Father says. Make an occasion of obtaining grace. Say, Sacred Heart of Jesus, help me to eat this fruit bread. <laughs> Is that what you say, Father Anguin said. I mean, mutatus mutandis with suitable adaptation. For instance, I believe she burns the porridge. Holy Mary, Mother of God, help me to swallow this porridge. <laughs> Offer it up as a spiritual response to suffering is a commonplace of Catholic theology and culture, but a concept wholly alien to Unitarian minds. And so it was astonishing news to Eliot, these stanzas of Adante, gospel news. After a lifetime of enduring his suffering, he finally figured out that there was spiritual gain to be had from claiming his suffering. His only previous encounters with metaphysics had been in philosophy textbooks, but in Dante, Eliot met a living faith whose metaphysics mattered. Only this can explain his lifelong obsession with these two stanzas of Dante. It not only explains his conversion, but his gratitude to his new church. And as often happens with someone who believes that they have just discovered the truth, it also explains the sometimes uncharitable ferocity of his early Christian convictions. I have one more gem from the archives for you. This is Eliot's uh, copy of Augustine's Confessions. This edition is a 1924 reprint of Dent's Everyman Library series. 
This copy, however, is not Eliot's reading copy of the Confessions, from which he had taught and quoted, and which was probably covered with marginalia. That now lost edition was the 1907 original, of which this is the 1924 reprint. We know that he owned the 1907 edition from the syllabus on which he placed it for teaching and from the quotations from the confessions that appear in his poetry and prose in the teens and early 20s. But we also know that he lost that 1907 edition because Eliot's library was inventoried in 1934 as part of the legal process of separating from his wife. No copy of the Confessions or anything by Augustine is listed in that inventory, which suggests that Eliot had lost, misplaced, or loaned away his 1907 Confessions. What is curious, then, about this 1924 Confessions is that unlike most books in Eliot's library, there is no signature, no date on the flyleaf, no book plate pasted in, no marginalia, no markings at all, and therefore a text that would seem to have no value to a scholar like myself who is hunting for marginalia, those traces that allow us to follow how Eliot was absorbing, reading, and responding to his material. Only one tiny piece of evidence suggests that this book was ever opened or used. A humble, torn piece of paper used as a bookmark. It is a delicate matter to hang a literary argument on the slender peg of a bookmark, but watch this trapeze act. <laughs> Unlike written marginalia, it is hard to prove that a particular person placed a bookmark. A bookmark can fall out and be replaced in a different spot by sub subsequent handlers of the book. But in spite of these difficulties, I want to argue for the provenance of this bookmark in this place as Eliot's own. Note the difference in color. The darker brown coloration of the bookmark shows that it has a higher acidic content than the pages of the book, yeah, yet, yet more of the things that Nancy is teaching me in the library. The discoloring you see on either side of the bookmark is not a shadow, but the leaking of the acid from the bookmark onto the pages of the book. This bookmark has clearly not moved for decades. It was not placed there by Valerie Elliott in the 80s or 90s, nor was it placed there by Eliot in the 50s or 60s. He placed it there sometime in the mid to late 1930s. What makes me confident enough to speculate about this? Eliot annotated his books copiously in pencil. So a bookmark in an otherwise unmarked book suggests a change in Eliot's reading strategy. The normal practice was to read with pencil in hand. But here, rather than reading carefully, Eliot in this instance was skimming to find a particular passage. And when he found what he was looking for, he placed a bookmark so that he could revisit the spot again. Given the absence of his original 1907 Confessions in his inventory of 1934, that means that this book must have been acquired and the bookmark placed there sometime after 1934. The depth of the discoloration suggests to me the late 1930s, but there's also biographical evidence to consider, and you've already seen it. His mother died in 1929, and I am speculating that this event sent Eliot hunting a few years later for his volume of Confessions. Not finding it, he acquired a new volume and skimmed until he found the passage that he needed, the famous and deeply affecting account that Augustine gives of his own mother's death. Here's my conclusion. In his years of wandering and despair before his conversion, 
the years of the Wasteland and the Hollow Men. Eliot had plundered Augustine's Confessions as a literary text. Before his conversion, Eliot used Augustine to anatomize lust in a meaningless world and to illuminate his own desperate search for a God in whom he did not yet believe. But after his conversion in 1927, and then his mother's death two years later in 1929, Eliot turns again to Augustine's Confessions. Not finding his old copy, he acquires a new one, but this time he approaches it as a devotional text. No longer the intellectual, with pencil in hand, forcing a mastery over the text, this time Eliot acts as a fellow believer, finding comfort in Augustine's heart-rending description of Monica's death. That powerful account, you will recall, is not a novelistic scene written to entertain a bourgeois reader. Its rhetorical purpose is not description. In Augustine's account, it is a prayer addressed to God, the I-Thou bond of committed faith. Its rhetorical function is to praise the creator who forgives and redeems, and who promises that Augustine will see his mother again in the communion of saints. Deeply consoled by this prayer, Eliot marks it with a torn piece of paper in order that he may return to it again. This humble bookmark, a testament to Eliot's grief, speak vo speaks volumes about his theology. By joining his prayer to Augustine's, he has figured out what to do with his suffering. Thank you. Jamie, many thanks for that gripping narrative. I think um, you've pulled off something which is quite extraordinary, which you've given uh, something which is of equal interest, I believe, to the Eliot specialist and the more general audience here. All of us have been touched in some way by Eliot and his poetry, uh, but uh, you've managed to say something deeply illuminating to both of those audiences. So thank you. Thank you. So now it's time, uh, we have time for some questions and discussion. Uh, those of you online are welcome to enter something into the chat and we'll get to your questions uh, afterwards. And, uh, but also uh, those here. So can I open the floor for anyone's comments or questions? Thank you so much. There is so much in that. Just going to start with the last point you made. In the tradition of mothers, um, a mother's faith vis-a-vis -vis her son, tradition that goes back supposedly to Miriam, Mo um, Moses's mother, not Miriam, sorry, <laughs> Moses's mother, and the return of course, Monica, as I understand it, also was the reason her son ultimately turned to Christianity and faith. My question relates to a remark. Did Eliot make this in the letters, perhaps, that when his mother read The Wasteland, said that she hoped her son would one day find a way of writing a more... Um, Christian kind of poetry. Could you comment on that? Yes. Um, I don't recall the exact quote, but it certainly sounds like something that, that Charlotte Champ Elliott would, would have wished for her son. Yeah. yeah. I can't... Can anyone recall the... The coming to the grail? I see. Yeah. She understood from Eliot that there would be a sequel to The Wasteland about the coming to the Grail. Mm 
Mm -hmm. that, I think that's what. And we have so few letters from his mother that I, I think it's unclear how she felt about his conversion to Anglo-Catholicism. Do, do we know much about that? I don't think we know. It, it must have disconcerted her, I imagine. Uh. Any further questions? Thank you. Um, thank you for this talk. It was really wonderful. I was really str uh, struck by your final um, comment that Eliot figured out what to do with his suffering and, and, and part of what he figured out was that he needed to offer it up in prayer. But it looks like he, at the time when that happened, he also misdirected it massively by making Emily Hell into the recipient of both the suffering and the prayer. And I was thinking about all these times where he either compares her to the Virgin Mary and or, or sort of prayers to her. There's, there's a, the moment where he quotes in French um, the, the Hail Mary and says, pray for us. Um, mm -hmm. He says other sinners instead of poor sinners. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering how much that was part of a kind of rewriting of a courtly tradition where you just cast a beloved of the Virgin Mary kind of, or, or if there's a, a deeper misunderstanding of what happens with suffering um, when it comes to being in a relationship like this. Yeah, I, I can answer. I think I'm leaning towards the first part of your answer to that. I'm, I'm not sure I can answer the second part. But the, the difference between... So Eliot took Dante as a model. He thought he was writing a new Vita Nuova, that Emily Hale was his Beatrice. But there's a really serious difference between Emily Hale and Beatrice. Dante was writing to a woman who was dead, who was safely in the communion of saints, who was not about to be sullied by Dante's own mixed motives. Eliot was writing to a real woman whose words had a real effect on whether she was going to stay in the relationship or move out of it and find somebody else. So that's, that's sort of the longer explanation of what I, what I said in sort of shorthand, Eliot's over-spiritualized attitude to celibacy. That like, oh, let's pray about this. Might as well. Uh, meanwhile, would you please sit on my lap? Like, it's just, just weirdly over-spiritualized, in effect. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any more questions? So I, I was wondering if you could um, say anything more about the connection between celibacy and suffering in Eliot, and was there a connection, and if so, how it showed, and, and that? Yeah. He certainly, he simply accepted it as a burden. I don't think he ever saw it as as an opportunity to love others more freely. Um, I did a word search through the letters, including the, the unpublished letters, just to see how many times he actually invokes the word celibacy. And it's, it's very, very rare, right? Imagine a married couple who, who've been married for 30 years who never use the word spouse, husband, wife, partner, marriage, like it's just, it's a very strange, um, and I think it's partly because Eliot wasn't part of a celibate community. He, he knew the brothers at Kellum, some of whom were celibate, but not, not all of his Anglican priest friends were celibate. So he didn't have a tradition in which he was living. He just had an understanding that he was not supposed to have sex. And that seemed to be just like the limit of how he understood celibacy. He didn't have models or a practice or a sense of, of how this is done in effect. Um, to, to his, in defense of him, you could say that there, there weren't a whole lot of those kinds of models. Uh, for example, uh, St. Ignatius in, in his spiritual exercises and in his constitutions gives all kinds of directions for how the Jesuit is to, supposed to think with the church or how the Jesuit is supposed to be obedient. And he has one line about celibacy, and that is, they should be like angels. Like, it's just, again, not, not real psychologically helpful. Um, so that's, I think, some defense of Eliot, that there probably wasn't a whole lot of that support of ways in which he would be encouraged to actually find intimate, non-sexual relationships. And from my reading of the letters, he, he very rarely finds that with men. With his brothers, I would say. Uh, with his brother, Henry Ware, I think he has that kind of intimacy. 
But even with uh, Ezra Pound, who was one of his closest friends, it's all, it's all banter. You know, there's just very little time where you feel Elliot being vulnerable. And it's something that he learned to do and was capable of doing with women. But you just don't see it that often with men. Please disagree with me. Uh, Lyndall. I'm not uh, disagreeing with you at all. I thought it was really good. What I'm, I'm wondering is if there could be a biographical source for his vow of celibacy in about 1928, when Vivian Elliot returned from the French sanatorium, Elliot wasn't pleased. Mm -hmm. She says this herself yeah. in her writings. He didn't want me to come back. And I wonder if it was a way of distancing himself from the marriage. Yeah. And that perhaps, I've, I've imagined that possibly uh, Father Underhill, his other spiritual directors, sort of encouraged him to distance himself uh, so that, um, you know, it, 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 he, he wasn't yet ready to separate from Vivian. But it was a way of separating. Mm -hmm. And she comments yeah. that this is a monastic move on his part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, it's just speculation. Yeah. yeah, but I think connecting those dots are about as good as we can get. What, we, what little we know about their sex life, Vivian and Elliot's, was not, it was not particularly happy or pleasurable. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued to read in in letters that's coming back to me of a particular victory weekend about, would this be 1918 or 1919? Because of the Treaty of Versailles, was it that 1919? Mm -hmm. um, she said, I ha she tells Mary Hutchinson, I had an affair with my husband. And they were staying at a country house. Um, so that there seems to have been a kind of, um, well, a kind of honeymoon weekend before Elliot went away to France mm -hmm. on, a, on a holiday. Um, that, that, I, I'm just, uh, I'm not saying this was um, important you right, know, yeah. in terms of the whole, the whole suffering in, the, uh, in that relationship. Yeah, but that there was it was ex rather extraordinary that that she should have they should have had that sort of interlude of happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what whatever happened in 1928 when Vivian came back after she was away in nine for nine months in a sanatorium. Months, yeah. um, so when she came back and Elliot decided to stop sexual relations, there there's it's unclear like what it meant like if he, if he meant it like as a private vow or if it was just a decision that he made. Um, it seems to be a decision that, that Vivian was not included in. And you're right, it's, an, it's another way of building a wall between them, which is why I've argued that it, that it couldn't have been an actual formal vow, because in the Anglican tradition, Anglicans didn't take vows of anything. Um, they were trying to s distinguish themselves from the Roman Catholic tradition, th those weirdos who took vows of poverty, celibacy, and, and obedience. Um, and I also would find it impossible to believe that that any bishop or Anglican priest would allow a married man to take a formal vow because that would make it seem like the Anglican church is colluding in keeping Elliot away from his wife. So I think that's why I think that it must have been just a private decision um, that, that he probably shared with his spiritual advisor, which, which you dug up in the 70s by interviewing that advisor. And he, you, when we talked about this a couple months ago, you, couldn't, you didn't know the name. It hasn't come to you yet. His, his late in life spiritual advisor whom you... Yeah, Okay. It wouldn't, oh, earlier, yeah, but it couldn't have been Father Underhill in the 60s or 70s. No, yeah. that later one didn't say anything. Yeah, at okay. All. Thanks. Thank you. Patrick? And after Patrick, we also have Father Frank as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jamie. Very helped by that. I like what you presented about offering it up. And it's clear that Eliot was helped by learning this attitude and adopting it. 
those of us who preach the wisdom of offering it up are challenged nowadays to explain why it is a good way to deal with suffering. Uh, is it enough to say, oh look, Eliot shows us that it works? Does <laughs> Eliot tell us why it is a good way? In any sense of a theology or a, a um, mysticism? Oh, so, yeah. So, yes, I think his answer is that it brings us closer to Christ on the cross, that, that the, the crucifix is the central image of Christian iconography. And so it's, and, and, and if you think about the difference between Protestant and Christian theology, Protestants have often uh, criticized Catholics for having this vulgar, dead, mutilated body on view. It's just, it's, it's distasteful. Um, a cross is much, for, much more uh, uh, tasteful. Um, I was hunting for this thing that I found um, in the Bodleian. The Bodleian has uh, Vivian Elliott's materials, and I found this hilarious description that she writes in the 1930s, but I couldn't find it, so I'm just going to paraphrase it. Um, so this is after the separation, and she's invited to a Good Friday service with Anglicans. And, and she says, well, it's just in such bad taste to, to, to commemorate the crucifixion. Um, so, yeah, that's my short answer. Um, I might have a, a more elaborate one at breakfast tomorrow, Patrick. <laughs> Good. Uh, Father Frank over here. Thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. Uh, on the issue of suffering, uh, you've explained how he went to great lengths to find meaning in his own suffering. Did he, is there any sign that he tried to make sense of the suffering he was causing to Emily Hill? Uh, uh, or did he even try to uh, teach her how to internalize suffering? <laughs> Which would uh, be a rather cheeky thing to do. Yeah, I think... I think I could have answered that better if I had decided to stay with the Emily Hale letters uh, on suffering, because he does talk about suffering there. But I, I haven't read them all through recently, so I can't, uh, I don't think I can pluck out a quote exactly. But I, I did give you that one quote in which he says he, he fears that he's interfered with her life. He's feared that he has ultimately caused her more suffering. Um, but again, that those sort of um, moments of clarity become confused with his mixed motives. He, he, he simply can't give her up. So that would be too painful to him. So he's, he's willing to just sit with the suffering that he is causing, which he sometimes acknowledges, and at other times doesn't acknowledge at all. And, that, and that's another thing that I find so fascinating about these letters is that when I'm at cocktail parties and I have to explain in two sentences what I like about Eliot, you know, one of the things that I say is that he is a masterful, masterful analyst of self-deception. And in these letters, we see that self-deception on full display, right? So being, being really self-aware and being doesn't mean that you, uh, that you are free of that very human problem. Thank you. We, one question from um, the online chat is from Alicia Smith. He wonders whether you have an opinion on how serious Elliot was about joining the Kellum brothers later in life. Um, she says she seems to remember he mentioned this in a letter previous to his second uh -huh. marriage. Uh, the one letter that I can recall is a sort of a humorous moment where he's writing to his friend John Hayward and he says, I'm fit for monastic life if it weren't for the fact that I, I would have to give up my Galois cigarettes. Um, so it that and other sort of moments make me think that I don't think he ever really seriously considered it. Um, when he was living for 11 years at Cheney Walk with his friend, the bibliographer John Hayward, uh, the maid of, uh, who, who kept, took care of them um, often talked to John Hayward, who was very extroverted and talkative, and Eliot rarely said anything. And at one point, John Hayward tried to explain to the maid that Eliot was actually a very famous person. And she said, oh no, he's a very holy man. Because the, the only thing he had in his room was this enormous crucifix that hung over his bed. So she, she thought of him not as an author, but as this very ascetic holy man. But in, far, in terms of like actual serious discernment, like contacting the formation director, I, I don't find any evidence of that kind of seriousness of, of considering monastic life. 
And uh, we also have a question from Michael Walsh. Are these letters themselves a sensorium of Eliot's suffering? In the sense that Eliot tended to stand at a distance from experience, he suffered through the letters and also gained artistically. Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. It's very mm -hmm. beautifully said. Um, I would agree with that. Um, and I think even in his poetry, he does that even more. Um, and I think that's why so many people are so passionately attached. And, and here's my bias coming out. I actually prefer the pre-conversion poetry. I deeply respect what he's trying to do in Ash Wednesday and in Four Quartets. Um, his, his ambition there is amazing. But because of the poetry that he wrote when he was alienated and despairing, there's a kind of electric quality to the love song of Geoffrey Prufrock and the Wasteland that simply leaps off of the page. Um, and then you turn to his prose that's very controlled, very judgmental, um, and, and scholars have always commented on this difference between how deeply personal and revelatory the poetry seems, and the prose is a more, the, the way that you've described it nicely, Walsh, um, sort of a, both a distancing and an accessing of that suffering. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mikey, perhaps this could be our final question. Yeah, um, yeah it's just a, a sort of on the theme of celibacy. Do you think that um, Eliot's re relationship to, to his celibacy might have been the way it was and perhaps not as fruitful as it could have been because it wasn't necessarily entirely voluntary? So he wasn't someone who voluntarily made a conscious choice of becoming a celibate, but rather someone who was partially maybe driven into that circumstance by accident and kind of, well, suffering in some sense. Yes, although as, as a, very, a very orthodox Christian, I think Eliot's response to that would be something like um, he chose the religion freely in which those choices make sense. So yes, he, he would not have chosen celibacy for himself under other circumstances, but he did freely choose um, the religion that put those impositions on him, or, or that he imagined put those impositions on him. Um, Emily Hale in the letters, John pointed this out to me recently, I, I, I must have breezed past it, but Emily Hale does mention in the letters she knows Anglicans who had gotten divorced. Um, uh, but then that, the, there's the other problem of um, civil divorce, uh, and that is that under civil law in the 1930s, if Eliot would have needed two things that, he, that would have been impossible. He would have had to have an affair, which was not possible for a person who was converted and is a public Christian. And two, Vivian would have had to agree to the divorce. And neither of those things could have happened. So thank you very much again, Jamie. I think uh, it's been quite uh, wonderful to see how you've definitely moved between the moral, the theological, the literary, the psychological. But despite moving through all of those different spheres and disciplines, never losing sight of the personal, the very real relationship between two persons that, you're, that was behind your, your reflection. Um, so I very much Thank appreciate you. that and um, given much food for thought for all of us. Um, so thank you again. Let's thank express you. our appreciation. Have a good evening, everyone.